Alright, what's up friends? Welcome back to another DevBlog review for the Battle Brothers upcoming DLC. This is DevBlog 120, The Barbarians Part 3. So, in Part 2, we introduced three basic unit types of the new Barbarian faction, that is to claim the North in the upcoming Warriors of the North DLC. This week, we take a closer look at their more specialized unit types. As always, keep in mind that things are still in development and may change. With that said, let's go. Drummers. Oh. As has been tradition for generations, larger parties of northern barbarians that go to war are often accompanied by drummers. In a sea of rhythmic tribal beats and chants, the barbarian mind will enter a trance-like state where there is only battle and the barbarian spirit will press the body to its limit and beyond. As mentioned previously, barbarians have a very physical and fatiguing style of combat and they don't pace themselves well. They are especially dangerous in the first few rounds, but if you can weather this opening onslaught, barbarians will then often find themselves exhausted. The rhythmic beats of the drummers will have barbarians press on to glory despite this, reflected in the game by reducing the fatigue of any barbarian on the field by a small amount each turn. Yeah, so it's, it's all going to come down to a small amount. Is it going to be like four fatigue points? So they're basically all going to get iron lungs all under the effect of that. Oof, that's crazy strong. A barbarian can have their fatigue reduced only a single time per round, no matter how many drummers on the field, but it may be enough to give them the strength to use an additional skill, which makes them all the more dangerous. It's worth considering, therefore, to make drummers a priority target, even if they themselves are unlikely to inflict any damage on your men with their wooden drumsticks. Beastmasters. Beastmasters are revered for their druid-like abilities to control the biggest natural predator of the world, the Unhold and lead them into battle as living and breathing war machines. They wear ceremonial helmets with long horns and decorate their armor with animal bones, but their most useful tool is a thorned whip with which to exert dominion over their beasts. Well, holy shit, look at that! Oh my god. In battle, the Beastmaster will always appear with one or more unholds. These mighty beasts can wear anything from a simple metal harness and chain to be controlled more easily, to having metal plates nailed right into their hide. Something possible only due to the Unhold's uncanny ability to quickly heal any wound, even during battle. A beast armored like this can be impossible to bring down if you're not equipped both for handling massive amounts of armor and health at the same time. Oh, that sounds like a fucking nightmare. Every turn, a Beastmaster cracks the whip to direct their beastly war machines to do his bidding. However, a Beastmaster can not do so if anyone is in their zone of control and they very much can't do so if they're dead. If an armored unhold doesn't get directions from any Beastmaster, they become confused, and every round there is a chance that they become feral, change to the Beast faction and attack players and barbarians alike in a mad rage of befuddlement. Holy shit. I guess I thought it couldn't get any better, though. They'll just make the barbarians even cooler. Right, let's put our tactician's hat on for a second and think about this. The first thing that strikes me is that since taking a break from the last season, I've been experimenting with whether I want a two archer or a four archer backline. And this to me is just putting more weight on the four archer side of the scale, which has its own liabilities, but you can quite easily get along with two excellent expert archers, but having four, it's gonna be super important to make sure you take drummers down quickly and other beast masters down quickly. Hmm. It's a lot to think about. Yeah, okay. I think also a lot with the what it's going to come down to in fighting these Vikings is whether spear wall is going to be effective or not. I suspect it won't. I, I imagine that they are going to have some sort of leap ability like the Unholds have that bypasses spear wall, or like the a sword master's lunge, something like that. I would be pleasantly surprised if spear wall spear wall works against them. Now the Unholds, they're already a pain in the dick to deal with. Now with the added complication that you need to take care of armor but that shouldn't be that bad i mean a, a good two-handed warhammer should be able to absolutely fucking wreck anything with armor i mean you're doing 200 armor damage with a two-handed with a good two-handed warhammer and it looks like I, I wouldn't think that they would put the armor values here at more than 250 to 300 just because it's not like wearing a proper suit of armor it's wearing cobbled on armor so it shouldn't be that bad and the whole regeneration thing i've never really found that much of an issue with unhold because even when i'm fighting multiple unhold you just focus down one at a time which isn't really any different from how i would fight them even if they didn't have the the regeneration so okay interesting so there's the there's the little there's the tier one basic 
little, you know, thug, naked barbarians. There's the level 2 guys who have a little bit of armor. There's the level 3s with the big armor. And then peppered through all of that, there's drummers and beastmasters as well. So a very high level Viking fight could be pretty, a barbarian fight could be pretty freaking terrifying. The big heavy armored tier 3 Vikings, beastmasters, they're all getting more fatigued from the drummers. Who are, I think I would probably target the drummers first and then go for the beastmasters. But at that point, you've already got a turn or two of these things beating the snot out of you. Hmm. Interesting. We'll see. Okay, so that was DevBlog 120, Barbarians Part 3. In the following week, DevBlog 121, Champions. So as we've talked about a while ago, we're overhauling how named items work and how they can be acquired. One way to get named items is fighting champions. And that's what we're talking about today. Let's delve in. Hitherto, named items could primarily be found by looting locations, whether you followed tavern rumors or ventured out on your own. Occasionally, but rarely, they could also be looted from particularly strong enemies, and that's where champions come in. Champions are particularly skilled and experienced individuals of any non-beast faction. They're guaranteed to carry at least one named item. That's it there. This guy's carrying two though, by looks of things. That's a non-standard two-handed flail, and that's the... I forget the armor, but that's 325 body armor for quite a little bit of fatigue. That's a named axe. Okay, where was I? You'll be able to easily recognize them by their special base and unique name. They are, in a way, mini-bosses. They challenge you to fight hard to claim what is theirs, and they shake things up. But prevailing against them will always reward you with the named item they carry, be it weapon, shield, armor, or helmet. So where do you meet champions? The most reliable way is to complete contracts with a difficulty rating of three skulls. Those have always been a high risk proposition for any mercenary company, but they now come with more of a reward for taking that chance, and the possibility of getting named gear by facing enemy champions. Another way is to simply play into the late game. The further along your campaign, the more likely that you'll find champions roaming the world outside of contracts or defending a location. While champions may prove challenging to defeat, they are significantly easier to beat than some of the battles around legendary locations. Okay. This way, you can also fill the gap in challenge between defeating your first late game crisis and starting to take on legendary locations, like the Black Monolith with your company. Oh god, that's awesome. And how awesome does that barbarian armor look? That's going to be heavy as fuck, though. I, I think this is fantastic. I any increase in the ability to get legendary items is just wonderful. And this just really underlines the point of how important two-handed maces are. And it also puts a little bit more weight on the scale in my debate between... So I, I typically run a seven up front, five at the back setup. So up front, my seven guys, it tends to be... Well, ideally, I would want warhammers on the outside flanks, then like a little gap, then uh, great swords on the inside flanks, then a two-handed mace, a two-handed mace, and then one person in the center. And I've been going back and forth about what that person in the center can be. I've tried a dedicated swords master, which has its own adv advantages. I've tried a cleaver specialist, which can be great, but overall I'm a little uh, underwhelmed. Or the most common, and I think the right solution for your center position, especially for the first 250 days, is a dagger master. So we well, have a dagger master flanked by two mace users. I think that's the, the the best chance you have of i mean like if i'm fighting a bunch of raiders they can have marksmen they can have other raiders maybe a leader and let's say a champion typically they'll stand back let their archers pepper you if all goes well your four archer or two archer backline will outshoot their archers they'll start a, they'll start approaching that gives you time to then move your lines around so that you're at least one but i Ideally, two of your mace masters with their wooden sticks can come out, bonk him on the head, and let the dagger master go to work and stab, 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 while that frees up your other five frontline guys and your backline to take care of everybody else as they charge. I mean, theoretically, for every one champion, a mace specialist with mace mastery and a wooden stick should be able to stun lock any of these guys. If they're immune to stunning, then it becomes fucking terrifying. So, like, the Orc Warrior can't be stunned. That's terrifying. And then that, that just means then that your backline, whether it's an Archer or a Shield Breaker, and I think you might want to switch that around depending on which champion it is, 
then bags and belts, quick hands, and carrying improved fishing nets becomes mandatory. I mean, it always was, but it just makes it that much more important to the point where if I get a contract and I see there's a champion and I don't have fishing nets, I'll just turn it down. It's too dangerous. We, we, we've seen how season 19 of my playthrough ended with a single hedge knight who wasn't even a champion. He had a two-handed flail, and I, tried, I did the old surround and stab, but he just swung his flail in a circle and just killed everyone. Hmm... Yeah, okay. This overall I think is good. I, I think this, this this is a nice little addition where in the short term it makes the game more difficult, but in the medium to long term it tips the scale in making things better for you. And look at that. That is a two-handed war scythe. Is that the war scythe or is it the war pike? Actually, that's the pike. Mm, yeah, I really, really want a two-handed legendary war scythe because I've been experimenting with a bullman uh, who has his issues because... He does a lot of damage, he's very accurate, but he has the same issue that a cleaver master have has, or a swordsman, is that he can only kill a maximum of two enemies a turn, whereas a t other two-handed weapon can swing in a circle or in an arc and kill multiple enemies. Okay, great. I really like that. I think that's freaking fantastic. Um, I can't imagine what else they're going to add now, so this must mean that the DLC release must be getting pretty close. So, I mean, they've added changes to how the game works, the economy, the entire barbarian faction, now champions. It must be close, friends. It must be close. I can't wait. And let's assured, as soon as it comes out, I'm going to be running two warbands uh, in in the same time. I'm probably going to go with a cultist playthrough and a peasant horde playthrough. Uh, going on at the same time and you'll get an, an hour of Battle Brothers content every day I'll do an episode every day and hopefully I'll be able to start streaming at some point and then I'm going to stream the absolute living shit out of Battle Brothers I can't wait thanks for watching friends and uh, be sure to check out my YouTube channel leave a like and subscribe thanks very much and I'll see you guys next time